one of the things that I would like to do this morning is to introduce the people who help the Cardinal Sunan Center make this happen, this little event happen. Uh, we received really very generous support, as we always do, from our board member, Barbara Schubert, who is out of town and not here today. Her husband, John, is here, and some of her friends. We also received support from the Institute of Catholic Studies and its director, Paul Murphy. We received support from the Ignatian Colleagues Program and its director, Ed Peck. We also received support from the Jack and Mary Jane Breen in Catholic Systematic Theology and its director, Dr. Edward Hannenberg. It's a very long title and I wanted to get it straight. Let me tell you how we're going to do this morning. We have two speakers lined up uh, sort of together. Father Brian Hare is here from Harvard University and the Archdiocese of Boston. He will speak first and he will be introduced by uh, Dr. Ed Peck. We will take a stretch break, sort of the way we did last night, and we will reconvene for a talk from Dr. Natalia Imperitori Lee. And at that point, we will decide whether we take another stretch break before they answer questions, or whether we take a real break. And I'll sort of get the feel from all of you about what to do. And they will. <coughs> And then after that conversation here, we will take the real break. We have uh, food to sort of re reinvigorate all of you, and coffee and tea and water. And then we will return for Robert Micken's talk and then close the day, okay? So now I'm going to turn uh, this event over to Dr. Edward Peck, who will introduce Father Brian Hare. Good morning. We're very fortunate to have with us this morning an internationally known and preeminent scholar, teacher, speaker, and advisor of ethics and religion in American and world politics, Father J. Brian Hare, who will speak to us this morning about Pope Francis's influence on the U.S. social agenda. On a personal note, I'm happy to welcome a native Massachusetts residents here to Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in North Andover, not far from you, in Lowell, Massachusetts. So welcome to Cleveland. Father Hare is the Parker Gilbert Montgomery Professor of Practice of Religion and Public Life at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University where he received his doctorate in applied theology in 1977. For the past 10 years, he has also served as the Secretary of Health Care and Social Services in the Archdiocese of Boston, where he has been a priest for nearly 50 years. In addition to his tenure at the Kennedy School, he has also served on the faculty at the Harvard Divinity School from 1993 to 2001 where he also had a stint as the dean. Before that, he taught at Georgetown University as the Joseph P. Kennedy Professor of Christian Ethics at the Kennedy Institute of Applied Ethics. From 1973 to 1972, for nearly 20 years, Father Hare served as the US Conference of Catholic Bishops in a variety of posts, including the director of the Office of International Affairs, and the Secretary for Social and Political Affairs. Among his many duties and accomplishments in Washington, D.C., he was on the staff for the Bishop's Pastoral Letter of Peace issued in 1983. During these years, he was also a member of the Vatican delegations to the United Nations General Assembly in 1973 and the Special Session on Disarmament in 1978 and he served an, as, a, as an advisor to the U.S. bishops at the 1985 Extraordinary Synod of Bishops in Rome. In addition to all this, he is a past president of Catholic Charities USA and a former counselor at Catholic Relief Services. <clears throat> 
Over the decades, his research and numerous writings, too many to mention here, have focused on ethics and foreign policy and the role of religion and world politics in American society. His writings include The Moral Measurement of War, A Tradition of Continuity and Change, a forthcoming article entitled The Modern Catholic Church and Human Rights, The Impact of the Second Vatican Council, and an edited volume called Catholic Charities USA, 100 Years at the Intersection of Justice and Charity. This spring, he is teaching a course for the Kennedy School entitled The Politics and Ethics of the Use of Force. Please join me in warmly welcoming Father J. Brian Hare. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here again at John Carroll. Uh, periodically, I'm invited by Dara Stanley. I take every invitation as an imperative to be followed without dissent. And therefore, I've been brought to this campus more than once. And each time, I have enjoyed it greatly, as I do today, particularly to be part of the lineup of these colleagues uh, who are speaking here today along with me. Uh, whenever I receive such a generous introduction as I was just given, I always feel it's helpful to bring the audience into contact with reality. Uh, that, that is to say, uh, just to give you an example of how ordinary things can often be in spite of all these titles, uh, it's true, I worked for about 20 years at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and one of the things I did was to write speeches that other people gave. Uh, and in Washington, that's a growth industry. And many of us, many of us who did that used to gather, as you all gather with your professional colleagues, and uh, I used to gather with others who would write for senators and congressmen. And I remember one fellow particularly who wrote for a senator for five years. Now, after five years, the senator not only had never thanked him once for a speech, the senator had never read a speech before he gave it. So my friend decided at the end of five years he would manifest his pent-up frustration with the senator. <laughs> It was in the midst of the Cold War. It was in the midst of the senator's re-election campaign for the US Senate. Uh, he came into a room with three times this many people in it, and he began his address. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I know you have declining faith in government. I know you think we can be neither efficient nor effective. But I'm here to tell you we can be both efficient <laughs> I'm here to tell you that we can hold down unemployment and not have rising inflation. We can increase our trade with other nations and not lose jobs at home. We can maintain our security and negotiate arms agreements with the Soviet Union. And I'm here tonight to tell you exactly how government can do these things for you. He turned to page two, and at the top of page two it said, good luck, buddy, you're on your own. <laughs> So with that, I will turn to the academic part of my... <laughs> uh, my topic was assigned by Doris Donnelly, and as I say, I take these things with some humility. And so it's Pope Francis, uh, the social ministry of the church, and its relevance for the United States. I'll proceed through it in four steps. I have some short preliminary comments to make about the Francis effect, its sources. Secondly, I want to argue for the primacy of ecclesiology in Francis's social vision. Thirdly, I then will try to locate Francis within the tradition of Catholic social teaching, and finally use some illustrative examples for the relevance of Francis in that tradition for the United States. <clears throat> 
My preliminary comments, uh, as I was being driven here kindly today by Robert Mickens, I find out that my preliminary comments to some degree coincide with something with John O'Malley said. Now, whenever I coincide with John O'Malley, I immediately feel better about my text. <laughs> <laughs> and so, because uh, it has struck me, and apparently struck John pretty much the same way, that I find three sources of influence, abiding influence, that it seems to me will shape the long-term effect of Pope Francis. Every pope brings with him a background, a legacy, uh, uh, previous experiences. Certainly, we think of John Paul II and his struggle with communism and how that affected then his crucial role in the collapse of communism. We think about him as a teacher, as we do with Benedict, and how that shaped the papacy. For me, Francis uh, is shaped by three forces. One, that he is a Jesuit and remains one. Secondly, that he has been a Latin American bishop. And thirdly, as was indicated in a piece I read only in getting ready for this, he is the first pope uh, uh, we have had who was ordained a bishop immediately after the Second Vatican Council. Each of those three things, I think, thematically uh, affect what we've already seen of Francis. When in Evangelii Gaudium, uh, 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 when he talks about the signs of the times, he said we should do it not simply as social analysts, but do it with, in a spirit of discernment. Uh, characteristic theme in uh, the life of Jesuits. As a Latin American bishop, he experienced the 20 very difficult years from the late 60s, uh, 22, from the late 60s to the early 90s. And during that time, he lived through the dirty war, which was an extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult experience for the life of the church and anyone in a leadership position. And then thirdly, you constantly find uh, the background of the Second Vatican Council thematically in what he says. So it does seem to me it'd be good to keep those three things in the background, and indeed I will invoke them at other moments uh, in my address today. But let me turn to the first substantive theme that uh, I wish to address, <coughs> and that is the primacy of ecclesiology in his social vision. Here, I think the influence of the Second Vatican Council is quite clear. It is the legacy of Gaudium et Spes, the last and longest document of the Second Vatican Council, <coughs> the document that was never intended to appear. In the design of the Second Vatican Council, there were a series of documents that were to make up the fabric of the Council. They were all, in some form or other, related to the idea of the Church, but while there was a document on the church, there was no plans early in the council for a document on the church in the world. Indeed, it was what we believe about councils, the experience of the first session that generated the call for Gaudium et Spes. As the bishops debated the document on the liturgy and the document on the church, uh, there was obviously a great deal of attention to the internal life of Catholicism on those two questions. And at the end of the first session, several bishops stood up, a handful really, but one of them was Montini, of course, who would become Paul VI. And basically they said, all we have done has been necessary to do in terms of Catholic theology, to look at the church intensively. But they said, as we've gone about our business, there are questions we have not addressed, and the world expects us to address those questions. The world wants to know what the Church of Christ is in the struggle for human rights. The world wants to know what the Church of Christ has to say about an era in which we could literally threaten the created order with nuclear weapons. You will remember that in the first two weeks of the Second Vatican Council, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so when they said those things, it rang true. And out of this initiative from the floor of the Council, presumably under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, there emerged the argument that there had to be a document on the church in the world, the last and longest document of the Council. 
Now, the significance of that document in terms of the church's social vision, I think, is this that by the time of the council, there had been an established tradition reaching back almost 100 years uh, in which uh, the church had intensified its teaching about the moral dimensions of politics, economics, labor, and management, etc. And yet, even as that Catholic social tradition, the moral vision of faith, applied to the public order, even as that developed over time, principally through the teaching of the popes, what one ended up with was a deep moral vision, but a fragile ecclesiological foundation. That is to say, many of the people who were the leading voices in developing the church's moral, social vision in the practical life of the church often found themselves having to defend what they were doing, often found themselves having to spend part of the time justifying the idea that the church should be a voice and an advocate and a participant in the public order. And so there was always this question, not did the church have a social tradition. The question was what kind of weight that tradition had. Was it near the center of what it meant to be Catholic, or was that out on the edge? Was it the required course, or was it for extra credit, if you were interested in the social teaching? Gaudium et Spes set out to answer that question. Gaudium et Spes set out, particularly in part one, set out to answer the question, where do you locate the social ministry of the church? And the resounding answer about Gaudium et Spes was that you locate the social dimension at the very heart of the church. Indeed, what Pope Francis says in, in the, the joy of the gospel, what he says is the proclamation of the kingdom has a social dimension. Now that is a fundamental kind of statement. And what Gaudium et Spes did was to, I think, essentially bring about this kind of deepening of the understanding of what it meant to be Catholic. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, no one would have doubted that to be Catholic, you had to be scriptural and sacramental. You had to preach the word, not only scripturally, but theologically, and you had to celebrate the sacraments. But once Gaudium et Spes located the social ministry at the center of the church's life, to be Catholic meant to be scriptural, sacramental, and social. And that theme found development and reaffirmation from John Paul II and from Benedict XVI, someone whose engagement with the social was quite marginal before the papacy. But in Deus Caritas Est, he profoundly deepened this tradition when he said it is equally important to preach the gospel, celebrate the sacraments, and engage in the social ministry. Now that background, I think, is there. And the legacy of Francis as a bishop that, to, that arose after the council and has lived his life since then, I think is evident when we look at what I would call the primacy of ecclesiology. In his chapter in The Joy of the Gospel, when he gets to the articulation of the social dimension, he, he talks about evangelization in a very particular way. He says evangelization is about the kingdom. It is about the notion of the kingdom of God. As he puts it, quote, to evangelize is to make the kingdom present in our world. He goes on, the gospel is about the kingdom of God. It is about loving God who reigns in our world. Both Christian preaching and life are meant to have an impact on society. That is what the social tradition had been about. Now, the background of this idea of the kingdom, it is interesting, for example, to remember that in the early 20th century here in the United States, the great Protestant theologian, Walter Raschenbusch, uh, located his social advocacy around the notion of the kingdom of God. But Catholic social teaching at that point in time 
was primarily philosophical rather than theological. Catholic social teaching was primarily rooted in the very important tradition of the natural law, a point to which I will come back. But the natural law philosophical vision oftentimes did not have a deeply rooted biblical foundation. It was only with the advent and expansion of biblical theology and its penetration of the theological fabric of Catholicism, which happened before the council, it was only when that happened that the notion of the kingdom becomes a central aspect of understanding the church's social vision. In Catholic terms, I think the way we understand the idea of the kingdom is that we put it together with two other terms. It is the kingdom, history, and the church. That is to say, the kingdom of God is the power of God brought into history by the person and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. That power, which is now inserted into human history, we think of that power the way Jesus thought about it when he was asked about his ministry. What is your ministry like, they said. He said, it's like light in darkness, leaven in, a no in the loaf, salt in your food. It is the power of the kingdom at work in history. And if the dialectic between the kingdom and history is that slowly, over time, never to be completed till the end of time, that there is the capacity to transform human history slowly and haltingly, never completely, into the vision of what God wants of the world. If that is the case, that the kingdom works in history, then Gaudium et Spes says, and the church should be the instrument of the kingdom in history. So Francis, in his articulation of what evangelization is about, locates the kingdom right in the center of that preaching. And the kingdom, once again, becomes for us the foundation in light of which we then develop a social vision to allow the kingdom to do its work. He has this wonderful single sentence uh, in The Joy of the Gospel where he says, true Christian hope which seeks the eschatological kingdom always generates history. True Christian hope at work in the world generates history. We create things. We make the world different. We reshape the logic of events. This is what, is what lies behind, I think, Francis's primacy of ecclesiology. But I think it even goes beyond that. I have been talking in the realm of theological ideas and theological themes, but I think Francis is doing another thing ecclesially. It may be his distinctive contribution. Unlike Benedict, he is not primarily a theologian. What he will say and do, we don't know yet. But it, it, he is clearly a man who knows how to lay hands on an organization, an institution, and a programmatic vision of renewal. So I think what Francis is doing ecclesiologically is not only extending Gaudium et Spes, Francis seeks to shape what I would call a pastoral practical ecclesiology, which in turn becomes the foundation of the church's social engagement. Now the quotes here are probably going to be repeated by every speaker, so forgive me. But I mean, if you think about this locating the church in a place where the social ministry takes shape, then we go to the America article. What kind of church should we be? Church should be like a field hospital. The church should be healing the wounds of the world. In the joy of the gospel, he says, our task is to protect the vulnerable of the earth. And our task, as he says it, of course, is to go out to the peripheries of society, the places that are broken, and broken lives and broken uh, larger events, and we are asked to be a healing event. He, il he illustrates what he means by the peripheries, not an exhaustive illustration, but it was striking, given all the problems a pope could look out at the world and find, it was striking what he identifies at different moments. He says the two great problems in the world are unemployed youth and the lonely elderly who face life at the end without support. 
Well, those are not the only two problems in the world. Those are not what the United Nations deals with every day. Those are not what the International Monetary Fund usually meets on Monday morning to talk about. But the fact is, he's trying to lift up the consequences of some of those larger events. So his pastoral style is, again, that the church should go out beyond the church doors and actually find the problems and not simply wait for them to come to him. So this pastoral practical ecclesiology, I think, in summary, locates the church in settings where then both the pastoral ministry emerges, dealing with individuals and their problems, but also the social ministry emerges addressing the world in its brokenness, if you will. Let me turn, though, from his ecclesiology, which I think is primary, the foundation, to the actual question I was asked to address. And here, uh, what strikes me as I wrote the talk and wrote a couple of others that I've given over the past three or four months, is that everything has to be said with a certain tentativeness. This is very early in a papacy. Now, you can always say that one year in. The problem with dealing with Francis is he has had such an impact in one year that everyone talks about this as if it's an already uh, established papacy, when in fact, by any historical standard, uh, one year in is fairly early, whether you're a president, whether you're a pope, or whether you're, whether you're a parent. Uh, their one year in is fairly early to set a legacy. <laughs> Some of you know that better than I. But <laughs> so my sense is that tentativeness is necessary here. And so my point is to locate him within the wider Catholic social tradition in light of what he has said and done. He indeed says of the joy of the gospel that it is not a social document that he doesn't intend it explicitly as an explicit contribution to what we call the social tradition. It has a different genre about it. But he is so marinated in the idea of the church's social presence that even though it's, quotes not a social document, there is much here to think about in light of the larger tradition. Now, I begin with this idea, that the code word for Francis in the press is, of course, change. Francis equals change. Change of the papacy, change of the courier, change in what, where he lives, what he wears, what kind of car he rides in. Everything is about change. But the social teaching of Francis begins with continuity. Continuity, I would argue, is the first characteristic. He depends heavily in the joy of the gospel on the teaching of his two immediate predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict XVI. He depends, as I've already argued, on the Second Vatican Council. He is rooted solidly in the tradition of Catholic social teaching. So even though he says it is not a social document, he envelops his conception of ministry and evangelization in terms of social themes. The ecclesial and the moral and the pastoral come together for him. What will be the contribution of his teaching style is an open question. We have a formal document now in terms of the joy of the gospel. We have his collaboration with Benedict in the document on faith. But is the teaching style going to be more of America style, Q&A, back and forth? Is the teaching style uh, now the only pope I've ever known of where everybody's following his morning homilies? I mean, that did not happen because nobody got in the room or only a few people got in the room. So what's his teaching style going to be? That may be necessary to understand in order that we can interpret it. Will there be a lot of social encyclicals a la John Paul II? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I think one of the open questions is not whether he will address the social question. He's already done it and will do it. The key co question is how he will do it, both in style and substance. So let me turn to his substantive, uh, uh, his substantive social vision, locating him within a larger tradition reaching back into the late 19th century. 
The first thing to look at is the discourse of his teaching, the mode of discourse of his teaching. Now this is an interesting question because as you look back over the last 115 years of Catholic social teaching, if you look back at that, there has been a shift in the way we articulate the social vision of Catholicism. For the most part, from the late 19th century up through the really great encyclical of John XXIII, Peace on Earth, in 1963, that period of time, which takes you through roughly 70 years, that period of time, the social teaching was almost exclusively, in Catholic thought, articulated in philosophical terms. We used the so-called natural law tradition as the way we taught about the ethics of politics, economics, war and peace, etc. We used the natural law tradition for two purposes. One purpose was that the biblical tradition, which obviously was always at the heart of the church's faith, the biblical tradition is broad, sweeping, powerful in its language. It is not discrete, concrete, analytical in its language. And so we thought about the natural law as taking the biblically grounded vision and articulating it in more philosophical terms where you could get to what, what Francis himself calls contingent questions. It's very hard to talk about deterrence in biblical language since Jesus didn't say a lot about nuclear deterrence. So the question is, how do you get to say something about a problem that threatened the world for 50 years if you only use the biblical language? Well, there was that uh, systematic, discrete philosophical tradition, but it lacked the very edge of the biblical terms that Francis uses. It lacked some of the fire of that sweeping biblical language of the prophet, thus saith the Lord, period. Prophets did not try to persuade. They simply called you to convert and left the rest up to your mind and heart. So it was the question of that style, that biblical style, not being very present. Indeed, Pachamenteris, Pachamenteris is very easy for an atheist to read. It is a highly reasoned, very powerful moral vision about the whole fabric of life. John the 23rd says, I'm going to articulate for you the rules and principles to govern first interpersonal relations. Secondly, the relationship of the citizen to their state. Thirdly, the relationship of states to states. Fourthly, the relationship of individuals, their state, and the global community. It is an absolutely soaring vision. It is almost entirely the language of philosophy. Therefore, that document in 1963 is interesting to look at because Gaudium et Spes is published in 1965. And what is Gaudium et Spes? It is biblical, it's ecclesiological, it's Christological, and then it addresses the moral question. So you set a different background. And as you look at Catholic social teaching since Vatican II, if you look at John Paul II and Benedict XVI, you now have a combination of the biblical foundation and the articulation of it in the more philosophical tradition. If you take, for example, John Paul II's uh, um, encyclical uh, on, in 1978, he, he articulates the natural law tradition looking at the, he was doing a, an assessment of the Cold War at that time. But at the very end of the encyclical, he puts almost an appendix on it. Having argued out all the great questions of war and peace and human rights in analytical, philosophical terms, he turns at the end of the letter and says, Solicitudo Rei Socialis is the name of the letter. He turns uh, at the very end and says, I do not think we will be able to appreciate the degree of the challenges we face in our time if we do not bring to bear upon them the language of theology, of sin and grace, of human nature and what it takes to, to, to shape human nature and human history. So you now have this combination. Francis, in, in, uh, if we take, for example, 
uh, the joy of the gospel, Francis comes down heavily on the biblical side of the question. The, when he talks about the place of the poor, it is biblical text after biblical text. When he talks about the mandate of the church to assist the poor and to be present in the world in its brokenness, it is one biblical text after another. Now, that's going to raise a question. That's going to raise a question about where he will go in the future, what his teaching will be like. Because there is, there, there is in the letter a couple of things that are going to have to be looked at, it seems to me. For example, when he starts to talk about the role of the church uh, in, in, in its social ministry, again, he quotes from the letter of, of, James, of, the letter of the, uh, James's epistle, which is so strong and stark about rich and poor and how we are to treat each other. He quotes Deuteronomy. Then he quotes Sirach. And then he says this. He says, this message is so clear and direct, so simple and eloquent, that no ecclesial interpretation has the right to relativize it. The church's reflection on these texts ought not to obscure or weaken their force, but urge us to accept their exhortations with courage and zeal. Why complicate something so simple? No. Oh. Powerful statement. The Catholic moral tradition, the Catholic social tradition, has thrived on making careful distinctions. That was the section function of natural law, is to both extend the biblical into the empirical with the distinctions that were capable of analyzing the complicated world in which we live and to do so in a language, philosophical, that others who did not share our faith might, be, might find in our moral wisdom something to support. Now, what does Francis really think about those distinctions? Those distinctions are Aristotle and St. Thomas. When we talk about justice, we talk about the prophets first, and then we get to Aristotle and Thomas. There are different kinds of justice. There's justice between individuals. There's justice, we call it commutative. There's justice between the individual citizen and the state. We call it distributive. And there is the justice of how we shape our social institutions. We call it social justice. Are those relativizing the gospel? Or are those extending and applying the gospel in terms of taxation, in terms of the role of the state, etc. Subsidiarity and socialization, not words we found on the tip of Jesus' tongue. <laughs> what do we do with those? What do we do with those? What Catholic teaching has done with them is to say, we think the state has a positive role in society, particularly toward the poor and the vulnerable, but we don't think the state ought to do everything. We think you need freedom in society for individuals to create things on their own. How do we think about that? The common good and the public order. Francis says that the dignity of the person and the common good are the two rules by which you should judge an economy. Powerful stuff. But if he's going to go down that road, what does the common good mean? Uh, do those two principles, common good and, and dignity of the person, those are extensions of the biblical vision. My point here is not to put him in opposition to anything, but that paragraph was interesting to think about in light of where we've been. Will Francis find this tradition of distinctions helpful? Will he find it necessary? In other words, that he must use it to explain, defend, and apply his powerful biblical call on behalf of the poor and for justice in society. So once again, think of some things he has said. When he gets early in the letter to talk about signs of the times in a discerning way, he talks about the role of the market in the economy and the role of the, of the modern financial system. This is what he says. He, he says, we have created a disposable culture. That is, say, a culture that marginalizes people and throws them away. He goes on. This disposable culture creates an economy of exclusion. He says in his letter, we must say no to an economy of exclusion. Here's the quote. 
that follows. In this context, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories which assume <coughs> that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the guidance of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Now that is usually not in Economics 101 at Harvard, I want to tell you. <laughs> so the question is, once you've said that, and then the economists come at you and say, well, the prevailing assumption today is the liberal tradition. Democracy and markets will do what needs to be done. How does he engage that debate? It may not be possible to quote more profits. In other words, you really have to ask the question, how will a wider tradition relate? Again, it's a question for me, but Francis says, he saves himself for the economists. He says, I want growth and distribution. That is a very desirable thing. <laughs> but you put that before the US Congress and ask, how do you get it? and you're going to get into tax rates by breakfast. And so, so then the question becomes, how do you defend your view on marginal tax rates? How do you think about what, how, much, how much spending there ought to be to take an economy out of the Great Recession, and how much debt can we incur? Those are reasonable questions, and the very power of his statements will require further discussion. Next theme in his teaching is he goes back and picks up two things of the debates of the 1980s, at least debates that I was fairly close to as I sat in the bishops' conference in those days. One, he goes back and quotes Paul VI and said, the pope should not be relied upon for all answers. That is to say, Paul VI had said, I cannot, sitting here, give detailed answers for every country in the world, every situation in the world. There was a certain modesty in Paul VI. There was not much modesty in John Paul II. I mean, <laughs> I mean he, he was powerful and we owe him great things. But the idea that he really needed the other bishops' conference to make comments on these things, not strong. And so Paul, uh, what he does, what Francis does, is to go back to a kind of division of labor in the church. In, in the joy of the gospel, he makes a point of, uh, uh, of quoting various bishops' conferences from throughout the world, the Philippines, African bishops, the United States, etc. And so there is a, a return to a kind of a modest center, if you will. Then he also says that when we teach this material, the social vision, we must become specific. Now that was a huge debate here in the United States in the 1980s. If you look at the two pastoral letters of the bishops on nuclear weapons and the economy, they did descend into specifics. They had a rule of interpretation. They said more, the more specific we get about complex empirical matters, the less automatic authority we have. In other words, it is one thing to say, do justice and let justice roll down the, from the hills and protect the widows and the orphans. You don't need specificity to make that clear. But then the question of how you protect the widows and the orphans, again, gets you back into the debate about growth and distribution. Whether arms control is better than more weapons gets you into another debate. So he has called for specificity. That is not an unchallenged idea from others uh, in the church. Then he turns to the church itself. He wants a poor church and the church of the poor. And what does he say about that? He says, well, we have to hear the plea. Every Christian and every community must be, quotes, docile and attentive to the cry of the poor and to come to their aid. And then he specifies what it means. He says it means working to eliminate the structural causes of poverty and to promote the integral development of the poor, as well as the small daily acts of solidarity we face in meeting the real needs of people. 
His argument here is, by all means, you need to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, etc. But he isn't satisfied with that. He says there are things that stand behind the rich and poor gap. There are things that he calls structural, and he wants to go after those. Those involve you in very complicated empirical debates. So the question is how you relate the moral vision, the biblical vision, to empirical complexity. That lies ahead. And so this is, in a sense, uh, just uh, tidbits that I have chosen out of his teaching that both affirm a path that where the social is clearly central to being Catholic, and at the same time raise questions about how that path will be received, how he will follow it, who is going to respond, etc. His final point on this, I think, is or of a final point that he makes is this idea that he calls for what he calls a new balance in the way we present the Catholic moral vision. That is a very long-term agenda, I submit, in which a lot of different people are going to have to be involved to find out what that balance is about. He basically was contrasting how often we speak to some issues of the bioethical as opposed to not speaking about other issues as much. And he says it's time for a new balance. That's a great mandate, and it will take a roadmap to get it done. So let me turn finally to this theme of the relevance for the United States, the relevance for the social ministry uh, in the United States. Uh, my first point is Francis's existence, his words and his deeds, his themes by themselves catalyze greater social engagement. I think before you get to any specifics, any statement, it's just his existence uh, in, the, in the white robes of the papacy which guarantees an emphasis on this theme. Every pope takes themes that he guarantees. Benedict XVI was powerfully committed to try to recoup in, the, in, the, in Europe and in the West, including us, a renewal of Catholic life very much a major theme. It is not that he didn't talk about anything else. This pope will have to talk about other things, including that, I'm sure. Uh, but this pope, uh, uh, just by his existence, will keep the social central. Now, when you try to take these broad, powerful statements and relate them to the United States, then you have to at least look at the dominant characteristics of this culture. And in the time frame I have left, which says five more minutes, according to that, I, uh, I will not be able to do more than identify them. So this is a culture with a secular state, a religiously pluralistic society, a market economy, and it's a global power. Now, every single one of those, of those uh, nouns, if you will, has a long story behind it. A secular state means that we may be deeply convinced of a whole series of issues as Catholics. We may be deeply convinced about abortion, about resisting assisted suicide. We may be deeply convinced uh, about raising the standard of living of the poor in this country and addressing the much larger question of the standard of living of the globe. But in order to be effective, we are going to have to convince by persuasion because a secular state is not going to place its uh, power behind a religious commitment. This is where you get back to this question of how you bring the gospel into the public arena. Indeed, the secular state guaranteeing religious freedom for every person and every group produces the religiously pluralistic society. And the religiously pluralistic society is what John Courtney Murray once said it was. That is to say, within one civil society, you have people who disagree on the ultimate questions of life. If you disagree on the ultimate questions of life, is it possible to fashion proximate agreement on the questions a society faces from any of those issues I've already talked about? A market economy. The Pope has his views on a market economy, and they are in many ways needed and welcome. 
but the market economy is the dominant economic model. He's both aware of that and not impressed by it. But the fact is, it is the dominant economic model, and to engage it, even to engage it, as he says, I'm not an enemy of people who are trying to deal with the world economic, but to engage it in detail is going to be a large task. And finally, a global power. Uh, his, his background as a Latin American bishop means he understands the United States a global power. It has not always been positive in his, his part of the world. And so how he will speak to the US about it. John Paul II was always concerned about that. So what kind of issues might uh, his words help us to address? My point here again is to identify, not to argue. Certainly, the first is immigration. Uh, he says that he talks about the new forms of poverty, the forms that affect women, single women, particularly with children. But migrants are one. He says, migrants are particularly important to me, he said, because I am pope of a universal church in which I, I invite countries to be generous and open in receiving people. Immigration in the United States is, again, stuck politically. There is very little chance we are going to get political action on immigration. The fact that we're stuck politically opens up space for other voices to enter that discussion. Um, yesterday afternoon before I came here, I had a meeting with Cardinal O'Malley and part of his staff because he'll be going to the border of Arizona and Mexico on April 1st to celebrate a mass as part of the U.S. bishops' statements uh, uh, and position on immigration. It is a minority position in the U.S. Congress, not necessarily, or in the House anyway. It is not a, necessarily a minority position in the country, but getting something done will be one issue. Francis is very concerned with inequality. He says the inequality is the root cause of everything. I don't know that that's empirically possible to say. There are a lot of causes of problems in the world. But inequality is one. He is interested in it. And indeed, many in the United States are interested in it. But that's going to take us into the question of the role of the state, the appropriate role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, how they can work together. It is taxes, fiscal policy, regulatory policy, the statements, the issues that bedevil us every day. He argues against the degree of inequality that exists in the world today, and the U.S. is part of that picture. And so issues of poverty and work, like John Paul II, he has a statement, he says, where there is no employment, there is no dignity. That is part of the Catholic argument about unemployment. It's not just economic. It strikes at the dignity of people's hum hum humanity. Think of long-term unemployment. I don't have to say this in Ohio. Long-term unemployment and its impact on people's dignity. So those are issues that I think are, are highly visible and that he can speak to. There are some other issues that may or may not cross his line, that uh, cross his vision in detail that we have to deal with. Increasingly, in, in recent years, we've had policy issues come up that are a mix of social justice and bioethics. And how we adjudicate those two is an issue. The health debate has been all about that. It is one thing to say with the bishops that everyone ought to have the right of access to health care. Well, that's basically what was put on the table in the health care bill. At the same time, the health care bill uh, expanded access uh, to issues in bioethics that the church was opposed to. How do you reconcile the bioethical tradition and the social justice tradition? Uh, the HHS de debate is simply a sub-theme of the larger debate that went on. There's more than one of these ahead of us. And then there's the issue of the US role in the world as a global power. As I say, here, Francis's experience as a Latin American bishop uh, means that he understands that role in terms of political economy. And I'm sure he will have much to say uh, about the world in general that can be applied to the US and may be applied in a unique way. But there are other issues he has not declared himself on yet. It is early. The issues that are symbolized by today, by the Ukraine, by Syria, 
uh, by the non-proliferation. These are political diplomatic issues. These were the raw material for John Paul II. He would, if you can imagine where he would have been on the Ukraine today, he'd probably be in the Ukraine. And so, I mean, there, that was just second nature to him. Pope uh, Francis has not come very close to these. He will meet it head on when he goes to the Middle East uh, because he'll be walking through a diplomatic minefield. Whether he's gonna be a major diplomatic pope, I don't know. But certainly the issues are out there. This country has to face them. And what he has to say, and I'm sure he'll have some things to say, even if they're not his major concern, will be of interest and nece necessary absorption for us as the church. Well, that's my sense of the kinds of things that he offers as a promise for us. Thank you very much. Well, Father uh, Hare promised us some tidbits. <laughs> I've never heard so many substantive tidbits in my whole life. So we thank you so much for that absolutely superb address to us. Thank you. <laughs>